Okay, so welcome everyone to our third and final series on sculpture for ACLS for this fall 2021. So the yes. name of Victor's talk is Religious Art as Public Art in a Multicultural World. And here we go. Uh, yeah, that's a nice title. I forgot about it already. That, <laughs> and it's indeed, yeah. So I, I do uh, treat my, my religious art actually as public art. By that, I suppose, meaning that it is not necessarily preaching to the choir, or as a matter of fact, not preaching to the choir, just trying to reach out to other folks. And, uh, and of course, since the, so in a way, I, as much as I need to illustrate the dogma, uh, I try to rather stress the human element and, uh, and the emotions, love, uh, primarily, because, you know, but, but uh, I guess disgust for sin if it needs to be. But, but uh, uh, so, and uh, here's a piece that is uh, in a, a public space, although owned by, by the church in Poland. And this was, uh, uh, I hope with the, the, the fascists, you know, coming there more and more becoming uh, popular there, uh, they one they don't don't take it apart this piece. Uh, hopefully not, because they use actually Germans as the scarecrow to rally their their you know rank and file uh, kids. Uh, anyway, so this is about Polish German reconciliation, but at the same time. The, the task I, I got when they, I was asked to, to produce designs for it was to, to do something to, as a, a tribute to, to a millennium of Christianity in, that, in the Northwest of Poland, which of course was uh, on and off contested by the Germans, by the Poles, by Slavs who don't necessarily uh, give much uh, about being uh, Polish, which, Poland, of course, doesn't, doesn't like that part. So anyway, so it's been definitely a, a lot of tense uh, uh, historical baggage that comes with this piece. And uh, so, so my idea was that the Christianity there should also be a symbol of, of unifying uh, the, uh, uh, the Europe, and at that time, Poland was also becoming, at least there was already invitation and talk of the United Europe. So this is a piece that in a really, I think, uh, sort of exemplary way, illustrates my, my whole idea of the public and religious, historic and uh, emotional and, well, as well. So anyway, so the cross, <clears throat> You may, if you can, on your uh, devices, you can blow it up a little bit. The cross is torn as uh, the, the his Polish and German history has been uh, rather stormy. And uh, so there's little debris of some of the wars and the division coming. Because, oh, the, okay, uh, the cross, the uh, original piece actually didn't have the two popes. It was just the cross. It uh, started by, by the, on the right of the screen is the, the German emperor, and on the left is the Polish king. The emperor is Otto III, and the king is the Bolesław Chrobry, and they met in Gniezno, which was at that time a ca the capital of Poland, uh, and they, they set up um, the um, three dioceses. And one was this co-object where I grew up, which is now a small town and didn't have Basically, it just disappeared for even for a while from the map. The other two were Wrocław or Breslau, which is a big city and kept the diocese always, uh, archer diocese. Um, used to be a German city for a long time. Now it's a Polish city after the World War II. And of course, Kraków, which is, you know, the, the, the seats were from which uh, the John Paul II came as a you know, cardinal. So, so that was the, the thousand years and a little bit plus now ago. And so basically that's what I did, the cross, and the cross at the top is uh, brought back by the dove 
with an olive branch. And basically, of course, the dove can always be the, the Holy Spirit, but also much more literally just a symbol of peace that, you know, if there is no peace and if the two, two Catholic and Christian nations or any nation fight and kill each other, so there, there is no cross, no religion. I mean, the, there's no, you know, holy war these days that we as, as Christians should consider seriously as such, you know. So basically, uh, so there, so that, that's why peace is very essential to keep the cross together. And then, you know, a few years, uh, uh, eight years later, there was actually that the popes uh, were added also as a symbol of Polish-German reconciliation, uh, the, the Benedict the 16th and John Paul II, that they were after all, you know, uh, very closely together uh, you know, as uh, Cardinal Ratzinger was actually pretty much the second in command for a long time with, with John Paul II. So, so then, uh, in a way, I wanted to show that also that uh, the, the you know unifying factor there, uh, and that that's uh, I think it's still there, and I hope it stays and and shows that you know that uh, the you know, friendship that slowly started, you know, happening there between the Poles and Germans can uh, be sustained. Okay, so we could now move to the to the newest piece, actually, Our Lady, the Empire of Knots, that uh, I already did that with uh, John Bergstrom of Hillstream, that, you know, he now represents me, and hopefully he, he joined in. I don't know, but anyway, so this was uh, commissioned by the, the Duke University's uh, Catholic Center uh, in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, she is, uh, well, Our Lady, the Empire of Knots, of course, she is a, a great uh, symbol of, of uh, devotion to Mary, where, you know, she just, uh, we pray to her and then she, she unties our knots. That was promoted by brought actually made international by by uh, pope francis so in a way it's also uh, a symbol for many catholics i guess okay we, we here speak you know a more liberal uh, pro, you know uh and not conservative uh, catholicism here so so they put our lady the empire of not uh instead of some other uh, anyway and here is uh, my favorite Saint uh, also uh, done with uh, John Bergstrom uh, is uh, for the uh, uh, St. Louis uh, Bray Catholic Mission in Oceanside, California. And that's uh, St. Francis preaching to the birds. And uh, uh, I always liked sound and interactivity and, um, and just telling a bigger story there. So, uh, so the, the there are birds. Well, the legend is that you know he he people didn't want to listen to his uh, message of, of moderation and poverty, uh, uh, and didn't you know denouncing the world power in for 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 the spiritual and you know uh, God's uh, you know kingdom. Uh, so so he. Uh, people didn't want to listen to that, including, you know, the higher ups in, in, in the, the Vatican at that time. So he basically, uh, he went to preach the birds and, uh, and the birds listened to him. Of course, you know, it, it's, a, it's a legend. He, you know, uh, the Franciscans uh, are careful not to make it, you know, this is just, they wanted to make sure that this is a, a nice symbol, not, not a necessarily real history of St. Francis, who is a very real, and I actually did doing, anyway, so, so the, the, the birds that are flying, there are wind chimes, and they hit, they're wind catchers, and they hit the leaves around them that are actually made to make a sound, so they, they make a, you know, a sound, so it's a very sort of uh, alive, and in the back on, uh, of the tree, there is actually a big opening. That's why the, the trunk is so big, actually, because I, I wanted to kind of get away with something smaller. But uh, it, there is a point to that, that there was actually 
to sort of like uh, a plates, uh, a, a cave of sorts, uh, a V shape where they put names of people who spread their ashes in the ocean or elsewhere, but they wanted to have a place they could come and meditate or pray. Uh, and this is, so this is a kind of a, a memorial or, or a group, uh, I wouldn't say grave, but, but something of the sort where, you know, uh, they can connect with their deceased and with the, with the sound and thinking of St. Francis. And one other thing, so, so he, he, I did the research actually, I went to, to Assisi and uh, visited uh, the cathedral there and saw his original robe. And it was a patch upon a patch and upon a patch. So he was really very frugal. And, and that also inspired me to use these uh, stainless steel because all my pieces pretty much, uh, the big ones are welded stainless steel and corten. Cor the tree is corten, the, the figure is for the most part stainless. And uh, so I used this stainless steel wire mesh uh, welded on top of each other to show the, 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 his, his frugality of keeping the same robe, you know, for, for I don't know how many years. And so this is, uh, yeah, another, he's one of my favorite saints, if not the, the favorite one. Uh, he's uh, here a uh, more of a uh, house uh, size. Actually, this was a, a private commission by uh, Francisco Benavides, uh, uh, Council, Peru Council in, in, in St. Louis. And he and the, he's talking here directly with the bird and the kind of, I wanted to make it almost humorous uh, conversation. Uh, so the bird is like, well, really? Or, or, you know, you really can hear me talk or say what, well, you know, and anyway, so that's, that's a life size. And here is uh, another welded uh, stainless steel piece, but this time it was actually it connected also with uh, gla glass uh, in a way that I wanted to show using these materials as symbols for uh, a glass, something uh, uh, more translucent, maybe less material. It, you know, after all, glass is actually a, a frozen liquid. You know, it changes over time a little bit because of that which very few people know, it's not actually crystal as such. Uh, and, uh, and stainless steel is, uh, you know, to, to definitely last for, for ever, pretty much in our human terms. So, so I wanted to, to contradict the, the, the solidity of steel to the spiritual beings uh, being uh, symbolized by, by glass here. And uh, this is my, probably my biggest and the most difficult, but also piece I'm, I'm very proud of. Well, it's, it's definitely inspired by the medieval, um, every time I stop in Warsaw when I fly, because I do shuttle between Poland and, and the US these days, although I'll be probably moving back full time to the US very soon. But uh, in the meantime, though, I do fly and stop in Warsaw, go to the a national museum there and visit their huge uh, wing with just medieval uh, religious art altar pieces there and they just so intense emotionally they show the drama of the crucifixion and this was definitely a piece inspired by, by that as well uh, <clears throat> but there was some opposition so the the pastor actually took him two years to convince his his uh, parish to, to go with that, you know, and, uh, and some, are, some were enthusiastic about it and some, some I think came on board eventually. Uh, so this is also something, you know, that, that I, I do like, you know, the, the, uh, for pastors to occasionally, hi John, uh, to, to be, to have the, you know, to, I, should, I wouldn't say leadership position sort of, but, uh, preach uh, through art, let's put it this way. And of course, preaching is not always just sweet talk, you know, necessarily. So that's, that's more or less about this piece. And it's the same church uh, in uh, uh, St. Elizabeth Seton and Carmel, Indiana, that, that has the big crucifix. Uh, 
um, Father Ted Rothrock actually was the pastor then, is also the Our Lady of Perpetual Hell. And this is, uh, I love myself to stop by at, at this, you know, chapel once, whenever I drive through Indianapolis, which is, you know, Carmel is a, a, a suburb of, of Indianapolis, and uh, stop by at this, this little shrine and uh, pray, uh, you know, yeah, this is, this is the actual altar piece there. And it's just, uh, it, so the, well, okay, uh, uh, I like going there, but, but and I for, often just forgetting that this is mine, you know, uh, uh, as I walk in, I just simply really, this is the mood I like to see in, in, you know, in shrines and chapels. But anyway, so this one is a sort of like a 3D icon uh, with the, the background, the iconostas, you know, the, the Orthodox church that's showing different saints. And so the, here are the, there's at the bottom on the left, there's Elizabeth Seton. And these are cast in glass, you know, the reliefs that are eventually cast in glass. It's a very long process, Mother Teresa, then an angel, just a halo, another angel, and then it's uh, Saint uh, uh, Helen, which was just uh, the donor's favorite saint. So a nod to her. And uh, this, uh, I forgot who, who, there's another contemporary American saint that uh, was added. And, and so the altarpiece actually, is not really an altarpiece, it, it's a stand, but actually you can kneel in front of it and has a trough. It's made from cork and steel, by the way, it has a trough filled with sand. So, so, so people can stick these, these uh, thin uh, votive candles in the, around Mary in, in a safe way. And, uh, and I think it really, it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful this way with fire. And uh, just as the uh, Polish German uh, uh, thing from the beginning of my talk, uh, uh, I was, uh, well, having a theologian father uh, who brought, read the stories of, of uh, martyrdom, they, they were, I don't know why, because uh, I don't particularly have any mean or sadistic, uh, you know, string in me there, but somehow, you know, the, those, those stories of martyrs were more interesting to me and my brother. So I don't know, maybe that helped uh, develop a sort of uh, sometimes being stubborn and sticking to my convictions. So anyway, that, that, that at some point led me to be uh, uh, involved in uh, as a student uh, dissident in the anti-communist movement. Eventually that led to me being uh, one of the uh, provincial leaders of the solidarity movement. I was even in the national committee and eventually um, still standing you know, for, for justice, I suppose. The solidarity was for that and freedom. So when I came to the States, uh, it was, uh, I wouldn't say I was looking for a cause because, you know, I was looking for, for work and, and uh, trying to get my first car. I had just 35 bucks in my pocket when I came with a crying kid, two years old and, and, a, and a wife. Well, anyway, and so, so I, I wasn't looking for a cause, but when I saw one, I, I realized that I may not be the right guy, but actually I realized that there were no black images in, in black churches or, or in churches. And uh, so somehow, you know, I, one of my very first sculptures was uh, a black saint, the St. Martin de Porres for, for the Rock Church in St. Louis. And uh, of course, uh, working on it, I made some rather silly mistakes, uh, you know, that, but luckily uh, there was a committee that they came and they, in a nice way, told me, Victor, well, it's a little stereotypical, this, or this could be a little more, you know, like, look at us, it's a little more. So I got an, got a, uh, you know, uh, a model and uh, got through this. And, uh, and then eventually it, it uh, took me uh, at the adventure with African-American churches, uh, with, with Black Jesus Project, as I sometimes called, was actually, took me almost 10 years that I, pursued between uh, 1988 to 1998 was, I almost exclusively even started with a bunch of interesting friends, uh, a guy from Ethiopia, uh, a black priest from uh, DC, 
uh, a, a Jewish lady. It was a really nice group uh, of, of folks uh, uh, and a, a priest in St. Louis and so on. Uh, the Black and White International, that was actually my, my business name for, for the studio. And as, as one of the projects eventually, there was of course the, I mean, the Stations of the Cross. And this was before, you know, uh, all the recent murders of, of unarmed black people, but I think it very much deals with just uh, brutality on showing, you know, showing actually that the same faith uh, also met uh, Christ and it, it is repeated in many different uh, forms. And uh, so, of course, the police, I, it was not just uh, white and black necessarily here. The police uh, in some other stations are mixed. So, so it's just, uh, you know, definitely the violence and that, you know, just in the uh, stations of the cross uh, and sometimes in the crucifixion, I, I, you know, I think this is about suffering and, you know, our, our religion, our faith is not necessarily all just feel good, you know, there's actually accepting suffering and fighting for, for our convictions. Uh, again, how far the, sh the, the, the fight should go, you know, there's obviously, I guess the Catholic Church is trying to figure it out and, and some of us believe it is going uh, too far, some not, you know, like, is it, is it my buddy or also your buddy I'm in charge of, you know? But that that's that's aside. But here, definitely, you know, the the the, the resistance. You know, well, I guess I, I remember the martyrs, and you know, Christ was our the first, and uh, and I think so. Let's just you know, dying for for our faith is is uh, you know, letting them kill us. Of course, not killing for Jesus. As I guess that was David Koresh. I think he's like the, the I will never forget that. You know, it's not whether you. Ready to die for that? Yeah, he's ready to kill for it, you know. So of course, uh, okay, never mind. This is totally off the subject, I think. Uh, uh, so here is actually uh, uh, because uh, my Black Jesus project uh, started with big church pieces, but eventually, uh, you know, going to different conferences, meeting parishes, we realized that there's nothing really to take home, you know, for people. So, so at some point. There was a, a, a quite a production uh, that I had in my my very mixed neighborhood with with uh, also a black and white uh, production force, so to say. Uh, the, no, not that big, but still it was like four or five of us at some point uh, making a, a take home, you know, like uh, pieces for homes, and even eventually these were reduced uh, to just uh, wearables, to little uh, uh, crosses uh, on a necklace. And uh, and uh, the, when there was a Rwanda at some point, hunger relief after the the, the bloody civil war there, I think five thousand of these little uh, medallions with the Black Holy Family were actually commissioned to use them as, for fundraising for for the Rwanda relief. So so definitely the 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 my, my Black Jesus project got really involved. Uh, just, just very deep into the, the, you know, all the good things that the Catholic Church is doing, or started doing, you know, to to bring other, you know, uh, symbols of other cultures into the the uh, outer expression of our faith. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, <clears throat> the a piece that I never. It's it's still in modeling clay, and I've just been sitting in my studio. Uh, but it's Josephine Bakita was a the Sudan, you know, she was a slave in Sudan, just the Sudanese uh, and a, a few other countries on the outskirts of Africa uh, were the, often the slavers who, you know, who ventured into the deep of, of Af deeper into Africa to, to bring slaves. And then uh, she was eventually, I guess, I don't know, sold to Italians or already freed, came to Italy and she became a nun as a St. Josephine Bakita. Anyway, so this is a piece uh, that will nev was never finished, but uh, I hope to, to make a mold and cast a few and just show it maybe at the next uh, uh, 
We'll go with John uh, Bergstrom to Anaheim next to March, and maybe I, th I think I'd like to bring a casting of her. And uh, here is the, a, you know, a set of uh, a black nativity that uh, over years uh, from a, a three, eventually seven, and then I think it, it has 10 now figures, two angels, uh, and uh, well, uh, it's in, in possibly 40, 50 churches national and nationwide. So, you know, uh, I feel very happy that I, I, you know, didn't get rich from it because we tried to really find methods of making them so they could be affordable even to a really poor parish. Uh, and I think we, we accomplished that part. So they, they really are just everywhere. And, and this, yeah, I might mention that, you know, that actually, mm, uh, even in some of the black parishes, you know, there were, well, I, I don't need to see uh, Jesus shown as African, you know, uh, to, to, to believe in him and pray. And, and that is, as uh, one valid point, but also in another, if God created us in, in his image, well then uh, what can uh, a black person say or a Chinese uh, person say, well, does he have to look necessarily, he, well, let's stick with this for now. Anyway, does, does he have to be a uh, blonde with blue eyes, you know, like, like it's in most uh, white churches in America still. So definitely, it's just, uh, let's put it this way, it's just as far off uh, the, the blue-eyed, blonde Jesus as maybe this is, but I think it's, it's at this point, we, we are fully entitled to just, to, just to be, if, imagine that we are in Jesus's or in God's likeness and uh, that he looks like all of us and vice versa, we all have something divine in us and that that uh, we have the right to feel that way. <clears throat> so this was uh, somewhat a uh, uh, cherry on the, on the pie, the, the, the crowning accomplishment sort of of my, my black uh, Jesus project. And this was uh, happened in 1990. Eight, uh, Bishop Braxton, who was uh, at that time uh, newly appointed as an auxiliary bishop at the Archdiocese of St. Louis, uh, called me one day and said, Victor, well, we are right now getting ready for the arrival of, of, of uh, no, sorry, but it wasn't actually that at first. He said, well, there is, for one, there is no, nobody black in this whole big, uh, Cathedral in Saint Louis, of, of Saint Louis in Saint Louis, and uh, so I'd like you to come up with some ideas for 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 a black figure, you know, Mary, Jesus, this or or maybe some saint. And I started working on some ideas, and then I showed him, uh, and one of them was the guardian angel that I was uh, designing for a uh, uh, high school in Newark that actually had. Uh, it was an old boy, so it had just two boys playing instruments and, of course, Angel of Harmony uh, as such. So it started then, but, but it, th that school didn't happen. And in the meantime, as Bishop Braxton was trying to, <clears throat> we were going back and forth on that for a few months, Tom calls me and says, well, actually, is a, right now, the, uh, the Pope is coming, Polish Pope, and you're Polish, so that might be actually a good connection here, and we'll do something big and black, you know? So, uh, so I thought, well, how about the, the Angel of Harmony? And outside, not inside, but actually it will be, be before any, anything else people see. And uh, so that, uh, that was uh, actually, he took it on to the Archbishop Regali at that time. Of course, we added a girl, a Chinese or Oriental looking girl. Uh, so one boy became sort of more uh, Hispanic. Uh, the, the kid, white kid with the drum, uh, that was also kind of a little uh, twisting it. And then uh, the angel is actually a, a black man. 
And uh, harmony, you know, music is the universal language uh, for everybody. You know, you don't have to speak a language. You can just sing together, uh, dance. So, so they are play, all playing instruments, the pan flute, the drum, uh, a little bell. And the angel, of course, his, his wings are uh, made of about a hundred wind chimes. And uh, so with the, the Pope coming, this all, all became all of a sudden really a big project. We got to go within the two weeks of, of committee meetings. Uh, there was a little bit of a discussion of what the size should be, you know, because we wanted it bigger and eventually it, it, we got it our way. So it's, it's about 14 feet and it's welded stainless steel. And uh, at times I had to work almost as weld every other night without sleeping. It was just so, such a major task. I only had one assistant at that time, uh, a tiny woman actually in size, but she was really a powerful force there. And well, she taught me some tricks of welding, which I didn't know even at that time. So, so it was uh, a great project that, uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, also in a way ended my active uh, involvement with, with the African-American churches. Although, you know, occasionally I get calls and, 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 uh, and it's still, you know, right now, as a matter of fact, uh, John uh, Bergstrom uh, he got a call from uh, California about a uh, processional uh, African-American, you know, church, a processional crucifix. So, so we're, we are working on that. So it's come a full, full circle here. <clears throat> and uh, in the meantime, I did uh, uh, for a, a church in Altoona, Iowa, where I already had some pieces done before. Uh, that's a welcoming Jesus. Uh, yeah, so I, of course, uh, I try to avoid just these kind of bland, neutral poses and neutral uh, expressions. And uh, when there's suffering, there's suffering and it should, you know, and the crucifixion is definitely not exactly, you know, a, a dance, it's, it's, it's dying. But then, you know, once you're resurrected, it should be, you know, and that's what our, faith, Christianity is all about, you know, Christ rising from the dead. So, uh, so then he's, he's glorious, he's happy, so should we be, and that's what I try to encourage through some of my um, uh, many pieces that actually show the sort of welcoming, smiling, uh, make, you know, and, and showing love, which is, you know, <clears throat> That, that's still, if not for love, I guess, what else uh, is there? And uh, uh, so materials may be there. Yeah, the cross is again, Corten and uh, the figure itself is, is uh, uh, <clears throat> stainless steel. But I, in this piece, I, for the first time I started mixing the materials. Corten, you know, is of course uh, covers with rust, but uh, rusty patina, but it, it stops. Uh, so it stays that way. And uh, uh, so I weld stainless steel on Corten. So Corten bleeds into stainless steel and gives it this really much more depth. And here is another piece still uh, going back to my uh, Afrocentric work is actually Peter Claver, uh, who was the, himself White, but he is actually a patron of, of uh, uh, Knights of Peter Claver, which is a sort of like a black man's equivalent of, uh, of uh, Knights of Columbus. So Knights of Peter Claver. And uh, of course, for a wider use, and especially women religious, they said, well, well why don't you maybe add a woman? So I thought, well, you know, many slaves had their women, you know, and wives, uh, you know, in some way or another, uh, formal or less formal often, but, but you know, they, they, they still try to live as much as possible. So uh, 
like everybody else, of course, the, the, it was often impossible for them. But but nevertheless, there's this woman who, a black woman who's helping him just as much as the, the wounded slave, as much as Peter Claver. So so that uh, is uh, you know uh, been quite popular with with women uh, religious and uh, and uh, the. The Peter Claver with, with the slave uh, in a four foot version actually was the cast I uh, did first in stainless steel for a church in, in, in Oklahoma City, Corpus Christi. And then uh, the uh, bronze casting of it was stand still at the headquarters of uh, the Peter Claver, Knights of Peter Claver in, uh, in uh, uh, New Orleans. And it was actually during the uh, uh, Hurricane Kat Katrina, it was, uh, uh, that area was flooded, but not as much as some others, but still, so the, the saint was like up to his, I guess, knees um, uh, was in the water and there's still a mark on the patina till today. I just drove there a couple of years ago and saw it. So, and here is a small processional crucifix. I'm showing it primarily to show what stainless steel can do. Uh, and it can do more than any other material, more than wood, more than <clears throat> bronze, more than uh, marble, because it just responds to, you can paint it and, or put you know, occasionally into it color glass. And then you can light it with, with uh, color lights little spots, uh, pin pointing, you know, lights and uh, polish it in uh, different ways. And it's just, it becomes such a festival of light that uh, looks like it emanates from the piece. So it's, it's uh, I think uh, it's a material that I, I believe could be used, you know, uh, for the same size, it, it, it just it offers so much more presence in a church space than bronze does, which, you know, darkens a bit with, with age indoors and outdoors, you know, of course, gets eaten eventually by, by, uh, by bird droppings or, or, you know, or acid rain. And, and it just, just goes gray often. Stainless steel just stays that same way. And uh, I, you know, like the Angel of Harmony was been, has been already out there 20, 21 years and it hasn't changed. It looks like it was installed yesterday. And uh, so I just, uh, you know, believe uh, it, it is the material of the future in, in liturgy, you know. And uh, this is uh, one of my older pieces, but actually, which uh, in a way, I'm going back to some of the things I did with it. Of course, if you uh, possibly could enlarge it a little bit, you'll see that this is a, a based on a Rondinini Pieta, my favorite Pieta by Michelangelo. It's not the one where Mary's sitting and uh, it's in the Vatican, it's in Peter's Cathedral. This one is, is the uh, Rondinini, but it's so called, but I don't know where it is actually, somewhere in Italy, I presume. But anyway, uh, Mary is standing and holding uh, Christ, and it's a much less polished, finished piece. It's kind of raw, rough, and it's just very expressive, beautiful. But then, you know, this was about resurrection, okay? So I added the sort of like one beam of the cross that was there. Another one is already lying down. So Christ is on the cross. In a way, Piet, I guess Mary was holding dead Jesus coming off the cross, let's say. Uh, so then, you know, and I added uh, the, the sun as a symbol of life, of, of well, also resurrection. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and the rays are coming from the sun, and some of them are used actually glass in the rods, uh, glass sort of forms. Uh, so basically, uh, and then the sun itself is a big opening inside that's filled with colored glass. So when and so I placed it in such a way that you can see uh, the real sun coming through the sculpted sun around noontime, and uh, and then the piece is just just all of a sudden glory of resurrection. You know, it's so much more 
uh, cheerful and upbeat uh, with the same scene. So, you know, in a way, giving us the, the feeling, the, let's say the premonition of, of resurrection. Um, yeah, so, so that definitely, and so the glass and stainless steel, it's something that I, it took me a while to figure out how to connect them, you know, because it, it's far from easy. But uh, I think I found some, some ways that actually to do it now all the way organically, almost. And, and this piece uh, is uh, uh, a more contemporary of a contemporary saint. Well, he blessed it, so to, you know, say halfway into sainthood, uh, is uh, blessed Seferino, who was uh, a defending a, in the, defending a priest uh, during the civil war uh, in Spain and eventually was arrested for that and, and executed, shot. So, so he's a martyr and as such a saint, you know, a, a, a saint just blessed, you know, there's, there's more miracles and I guess then eventually becomes a saint. But anyway, uh, so he's shown here being executed. And uh, so there comes my, you know, my stories that dead read us about the martyrs. So I finally, had the chance to, to fully uh, show something and in, in, in a contemporary, you know, of a contemporary execution, uh, not be you know saints being eaten by by lions or or, or you know or burned at you know at uh, stakes. Although that was also the often dark side of the, of the Catholic Church burning witches. But but that's uh, aside here. <clears throat> Here is the, well, the, a little personal story because I, I really like this, this piece, you know, and what, what I managed to do with it. Uh, well, I don't know, I think I welded uh, and tried, there was a time when I tried to prove to myself that I can, uh, can run marathons and also uh, weld in, in 40, I mean, Celsius in 105 degrees heat and then live in a place with, without air conditioning in St. Louis in the summer, which, well, at some point, you know, I was, got so dehydrated that I fainted one time in my life. That was just trying to prove, you know, something silly that, you know, uh, we are still <clears throat> material only, at least more or less uh, here. And, uh, or at least things that we can control are material. Uh, so, you know, I, I know how, and, and the fainting itself felt in a, you know, it wasn't, I didn't think I was falling. It seemed like I was trying to stand, but the earth started like standing up at, under my feet. And when it came to actually uh, the Seferino being executed, so I thought, well, that could have well felt to him like that. So that's what I showed. He's, he's, with hands tied tied behind his his you know back, he's being ex shot, and there's of course a little a painted blood on on his vest there, and and his and the earth, the piece he's standing or rock whatever is just just turning up on him there, but it also had a, a another very important element that uh, as he's placed in such a, in a fountain. That well, uh, the the rock the, he's standing is actually has water being fed to it at the top, so the water just just uh, flows gently over the rock, and the idea was that as you see the the sun coming from behind him, the parking lot is to the left, and so so people walking from the parking lot see him uh, kind of uh, face on. And then they, as they walk to the fountain to him, you know, they turn to the church's entrance. And uh, this, the mass, usually the mass 11, 12 o'clock, the, the sun is so high that basically as they walk from the parking lot, they don't see the rock and the water. They just see the sun reflected in the running water. And it's just the, the bowl, of the, the, the explosion of light. So as he's being, you know, dying, defending Christianity there as a martyr, he's basically already being almost, uh, you know, uh, 
sort of the, the feel of what would that be going to heaven, you know, the, 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 the ball of light that he's already, he's not standing on earth anymore. He's already being, you know, ascension sort of the, uh, <clears throat> to heaven. Uh, so so that, that's the piece. And it's still in, uh, that's uh, near Savannah, Georgia. Uh, somewhere there, haven't been there for a very long time. But anyway, so that's a blessed Seferino. And this is, this is a fountain with, with cork and steel rock and, and a welded stainless steel saint <clears throat> and lots of light. And uh, here is a, I was just, uh, <clears throat> still last year, it's amazing actually how, how, how the last two years, how they, long they seem. Um, Pre-COVID, but it was sort of, uh, it's already started somewhere there, but it was, I think, uh, I brought my, my son, who some of you saw in Anaheim, Jonas, and uh, I just, just wanted to visit <clears throat> Monsignor Ray East, is my, my good friend, and, and happens to be Black, so I thought you know, Jonas should see some of my Black friends, so he, he just grows, you know, so it was basically just uh, taking my G education, his education to my, my hands and showing him the world as it is, which is multicultural as much as it gets. So I came to Reist and then Reist took us to, to St. Joseph Church. This is the uh, associate pastor there, I forgot his name. Uh, and so we are uh, posing here in front of my St. Joseph with, with uh, Jesus uh, there. That's one of my, my Black Saints pieces from <clears throat> some 15 years ago. Yeah, so this is uh, revisiting. And here's some of my public art that uh, may have a little bit to, to do even with, with the, the biblical theme, the Jonah, and of course, uh, uh, and the, the whale. And uh, <clears throat> so the idea that he could, you know, the mouth could be such that you can go in and out what definitely comes from from the bible you know so um, so i had this commission for a, a city in poland that's actually they had some some uh, whales that made it all the way to the baltic sea and then got beached at some point and uh, i think eventually they they <clears throat> this became a legend there although it, it is a historic fact that it was research and the mayor wanted to use these as something as a symbol for for that otherwise i mean un, you know unrecognizable for a while town so it became became actually this helped establish it as a, as a, a rec, much more recognizable place on the map of polish uh, baltic sea you know summer resorts and uh, what's interesting about this piece is other than the size I didn't actually weld all of it. I did the models and then with, with a couple of engineers, we digitized them. So this is actually not the bent uh, stock. It's actually all welded, four walls welded. So, you know, these were really twisted forms, very difficult. So without good computer work, this would, would, would be very, almost impossible. But I wanted this to be very interactive. So the fins are the, 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 the benches, you can walk through the mouth, photograph yourself, and then of course climb. And, uh, and also if we could go back just for a short moment there to, to the whales, actually the, the most important part that I like big things uh, in public space, but at the same time, I don't think art should, uh, should dominate the space. Uh, so, so they're see-through, you know, and uh, the concept of a sc big sculpture that you can see through, walk through and does not obscure because as you imagine behind the, the, the whale, and then you would look at the whale, you would also look at the, at the, at the, the seascape, the, the ocean there, and there's a little cliff. So basically I wanted just people walking and seeing the, the, the ocean at the same time, you know, as they see the, the whales. So, so that was the important part of the, so in short being site specific, and even, you know, that goes for, for a lot of my religious pieces that, you know, like placing Saint Sefer, Blessed Seferino, you know, to the light or the Pieta with the sun. And actually I had a, a piece for 9-11 for at one of the churches that also had the sun 
that uh, you can, as you walk uh, at the Epiphany Church there, um, you, you see the sun through a sculpture of the sun. So, so that, that's, that's all really seeing the site and, and using it uh, for, you know, just to, to strengthen it, uh, to make the message, you know, really uh, focused on, on the, the community there. Uh, but also, you know, use it as the, the elements, the green uh, and and the uh, you know the the sun and everything to to the the best advantage. And uh, so here is yeah. Speaking of the green, uh, it's my uh, eventually uh, I was I think in two thousand and five I got. Uh, kind of late, but uh, still, you know, uh, ahead of many people who only now are starting to realize that the global warming is the problem, big problem facing us. So I, I decided to, uh, to, to use my art as actually to, to start uh, talking about uh, the climate change, global warming, and that, that there'll be less and less trees. So this is the, the, the project that I've been uh, doing uh, uh, since 2005 and as a, in part, as a part of it, it the, the, the tree, tree huggers, as I call them, they're all made from uh, biomass, which is usually willow, sticks, sometimes uh, invasive species uh, that uh, local communities want to get rid of them, you know, bushes of some kind or another, and they are just tied together and uh, with uh, a tie wire, which is the wire used for, for rebar, for uh, concrete. So this wire is not zinc coated or in, in, so it's going to rust and eventually fall apart. So of course, probably if later than, than the sticks, but never, and that, so the whole idea is that sometimes they are protected, but nevertheless, this is about the entropy that uh, it should fall apart, you know? And so, so eventually this line is the, the, the most uh, prominent of, of this whole project. And it uh, shows a line of, of uh, people to a symbolic last tree that, you know, they'll be with the global warming and there'll be less and less nature eventually for us to embrace. And this line, this is at the climate summit 2008 in Poland, in Poznan, and then it went to the mayor of Poznan invent, invited us and, and paid for actually the, the installation growing bigger because I, I came up with the idea that, that this might well illustrate uh, the, the increase of CO2. So, so each, uh, each part per million of more CO2 is reflected by one extra figure. And it, in those days, if this was 2008, the uh, increase was about two parts per million of CO2 in the, the atmosphere. Now it's already three parts per million a year. So, so the line is growing now precipitously actually longer. So it came to about 30 figures. Uh, and it's, it, in the meantime, was purchased by a sculpture park in France in Etreta on the, the cliffs there of Normandy. So unfortunately they stopped because, you know, uh, we, we may come back. I hope that they finally, that the owners uh, invite us back. And so we can add more figures because that, and I'm thinking right now about another one. Uh, oh, as a matter of fact, this has at some point, uh, Pope Francis is actually one of the leaders of the environmental movement, as we all know. So I added him as one of the figures and he, he at some point, he was also hugging the tree. So, so, and I now I would like to premiere another line uh, since that one is already sort of uh, settled uh, in France. One uh, at the Peter Saint Peter Square to maybe premiere it in a, in a in a year or whenever I, I manage to actually get money for it, and and then travel through the south of Europe to Brazil and go to the Amazon and and maybe visit some towns there from where people you know still are involved in uh, in this this uh, scary you know uh, 
cutting the the rainforest uh, action you know so so that that just to to speak about that well that's uh probably longer i don't know than i was uh, going to but uh, you didn't say stop or <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so now i hope that you guys have some questions uh, um, yeah, Gilbert has a question. He wanted to know, does the paint on the stainless steel last or does it fade over time? Is it more of an enamel type of treatment um, or what is it? it it's, it's both. It's uh, sometimes, you know, for indoors, it, I use just the, the paint and it lasts fine because, you know, uh, it's... Uh, the, the elements don't get in the way. For outdoors, it uh, I use different some paints that just just spray paint, and of course they they fade some of them. Some fade much uh, slower, and then I use enamels occasionally and other color metals actually for and then glass if I can uh, afford it because that's just a costly process to to be permanent, uh, but. But I do like, you know, of course, going with wood, sometimes I was adding wood so it would start rotting, then the paints fade away. So the sculptures are alive, so that they're not just set in one sort of look forever. So I, I, I like the idea of just, just the pieces there, you see what it was originally all about, but at the same time, the, the, the time passage still shows there. I have a I question. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Um, thank you. I just think that, um, that, that this is extraordinary. And the work with the African-American community and churches is, is, is such an important project. So, um, and my question is about those materials you're using. Are you, when you're working in this um, welded stainless steel, and core ten, is this a, like a direct fabrication? It's not yes. casting. So you're directly welding with big sheets, are they hollow or or could you just talk a little bit about how you the do the process? That? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, that they are, are they're totally like pretty much shooting from the hip. You know, I just start wherever from a hand, from from a head, well, usually from the head, but but uh, yeah, they're hollow. And they are made from uh, usually small rods, uh, um, uh, strips of metal, some junk. Uh, and if the community is somewhat, you know, more open to a contemporary look, I even try to quote recycling. So I sometimes stick in a in a robe somewhere, maybe in a less visible place, just in case. Uh, the pastor is not sure if his his folks will not complain about it too much, uh, a, like a compacted, you know, the stainless steel pot or something, which looks nice, but it still looks like a compacted, you know, pot. And uh, so, so in a way, I just smuggle a little bit of message of, of uh, recycling, you know, there. But yeah, and it's but usually it's just the the small rods, and there first uh, I join them with the MIG which is a, a gun that shoots also stainless steel wire in a co you know, there are different shielding gases in the States. And it's of course, this is the best one, but, but it's expensive here, but it's crazy expensive in Europe because Europe doesn't produce helium. So there are different uh, combinations. If we want to be technical, it's usually argon with the two and a half percent CO2 for for just the TIG welding, which comes next, is actually I don't really join the pieces with the TIG because it would be too tedious, but I use it sort of, imagine a little micro blow gun that you would use on wax. You just, just I make the pieces sort of uh, flow there. The, I mean, the metal uh, and sometimes stainless over corten, it, it just, just runs out. So it's, it's tedious and, and slow. Uh, and it's very technical, you know, so you just, just work with your hands there, but, but it, it eventually, it's just beautiful. You know, I, I was once read that uh, Rodin, uh, his, if you look at Rodin's pieces, he, uh, he never really 
draws lines. And, and so I, I read how he actually produces lines. The lines were for him, the expression of the inner energy that just hits the surface from underneath, from within. And then you all of a sudden see the line of just, just the you know, two planes to touch each other, but pushed by the energy from within. And of course, I tried to do it in clay. No, just couldn't get anywhere. The, just, that just looked ugly. And, you know, I, and clay is, I do plas you know, plasticine on small pieces when needed. And on small scale, it works okay. But I just never quite could get that. And eventually I discovered a material where I could exactly get that, you know, which was melting stainless steel with, with a TIG gun, you know, and just all of a sudden starts flowing and you, you cannot draw any lines, but you can produce them by just, just removing the metal. And it's, it, I love that that's part about the stainless. Thank you. Victor didn't talk about his early life at all, but it's very interesting. He went to art school in Poland and he was a member of the committee that started Solidarity. He worked with Lech Walesa and the way that he came to the United States is that he was asked to leave Poland. And in a way it was fortuitous because it sounds like he could not have gone in the direction that he went with the stainless steel in Poland. Um, things work together. And I think he has become a great artist, um, partly as a result of living in two places. And that's a wonderful gift. Well, I, I actually, at this point, yeah, I, 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 I think I find the, both the fee, in both the, you know, Poland and Europe and all the problems there and, and the States with American problems. I don't know, I find problems actually an inspiration to my art, so you know, human problems. So uh, there's plenty of them, it seems like, you know. You hear me now? Oh, yes. John, great oh, to okay. hear your voice. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for all the mix ups here. I've done a lot of Zooms, but I don't know what happened today. It, it, the odds were against me. Anyway, uh, I wanted to say that. Uh, you know, Victor and I, I've known Victor for many years, but, uh, and we'd meet up at these conferences and so forth. And I always liked his work, but we only got together uh, just a couple of years ago. And uh, we've had several projects and one that he's working on now. Um, what I like about Victor's work is that it has at once kind of a gritty quality and, um, and, it's so unique because of his work in steel. And it's amazing to me that he can achieve such detail with these hard materials, uh, faces, hands, and feet, um, all done you know, with welding and grinding and that sort of thing. And um, it's, to me, I love that texture. And, um, I think it's so much more interesting because it kind of draws the, the viewer into the work um, when, um, when everything is done for you, um, it's not so interesting. But I like the texture uh, much more than the hyper uh, realistic detail. And um, so I think of Victor's work as kind of inviting the viewer into the work that he's doing. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Victor. We really appreciated your talk today and we need to wrap it up now. So yep. thank you so much.